You're listening to Well, I Laughed, part two of Out and About, Swan Dive. Casey, will you adjust the camera so it's pointed a little more up? We're taking up far too much of the frame right now for my liking. (laughs) Oh, also, um, Pupfish is having a moment again. I think we've gotten another 100,000 views. I saw a couple comments that were like... I'm trying to delete them. If you could stop watching the (laughs) notifications on your phone... That one doesn't bother me. I could protect you. (laughs) Um, you. Someone commented on the Harvard v. Yale message, or one on YouTube... Oh yeah, I made the mistake too, of looking at stuff I need, a, I need a little bit of the table in the in the frame. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Yeah. Um, and they were like, the story was great until she over-explained it. And then like, uh, And then an quit emoji. your yapping. Was that yes, how it ended? And I was like, okay. I made the mistake, never doing this again. Of going on YouTube. And looking at the yep. comments. Why no. are they so mean to us? They're really mean. The, I've really just started only deleting comments that are like vitriolic mean. Yes. There's a one, our video where I'm going like, oh, I'm realizing what I might be per- say is being perceived as mean, but like, I love them and like, it's yeah. a joke in their friend group. And you were there when I said that. Yeah. So you know the like warmth in my heart when I said yes. it. And someone commented, gay men will say the meanest shit about people that if you said to them they would crumble in a second and it was like who are you a friended for i my thought man? that comment was hilarious thank you <laughs> oh their comment was hilarious i was like mm, i know homophobia when i experience it <laughs> i didn't perceive it as homophobic i just perceived it as true gay men are mean sometimes <laughs> yeah but like in a fun way yeah <laughs> so it's just when uh, you can see the context this isn't well situation. i laughed right now it is like well what else do you have wrong with me well Maya? i might have cried <laughs> well speak your truth so I'm right here. Uh, no, cheers. Cheers. And happy St. Patrick's happy Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I don't know if you could hear that or not, friends. Uh, bartender Casey of Casey's Cocktails made us these gorgeous Little green drinks. green gin and tonics. For um, St. Patrick's Day today. And if you look closely enough, uh, you might be able to see just the bottom of his sock yep. at the top of the mirror. Just some toes. Just in case they're interested. Okay, you. We Please have, leave. <laughs> we're gonna have to cut that because we don't give that kind of content away for free, and you know that. Join our Patreon. We've been <laughs> over this. So <laughs> get it, get it. Um, so while driving over here, yes. On because today is actually St. Patrick's yes. Day, right? Okay. Um, while driving over here, mm-hmm. I got to experience one of the greatest joys one can experience when driving, and that is. Uh, when you're driving downtown and you're parked at a red light, you get to witness a couple having a fight on the corner. And that's, oh, that's always kind of just fun to watch because what else are you going to look at? You try not to be on your phone as much here in your 30s. <laughs> um, it's extra funny on St. Patrick's Day when one of them has a little leprechaun hat and the other one has like uh, like a the, hair thing with the, that the spring yes. ear thing. What's yeah. that? What's that? Like a headband. bandana, a headband. Thank mm-hmm. you. That then has the springs with two little Irish clovers yeah. at the end of them, and she's Shamrocks. like yelling, and they're like bouncing <laughs> up and down, and a man in a tiny little leprechaun hat looks both ashamed and not taking any of the blame at the same time. Mm-hmm. So funny. It was the one of the few times yeah. where I was like, honestly, let's get more pedestrians. Let's Let's keep this red light going. <laughs> the, yeah, Casey and I went and walked the dogs, and we saw we walked them probably around 6. Mm. And usually, like, we live in Denver, right? There's people out on right. Friday nights. Um, usually around 6, though, it's it's pretty chill still. <laughs> like, people are coming out, but no one's, no one's like, right. crazy. We saw so many people. That was like, there was two of them that we passed, and then they were like, where's Dio Mio? And I was like... You're several what? blocks away. <laughs> Why are you going to a nice-ish Italian restaurant? <laughs> What's happening? Dressed as you are. You're dressed at yet. Yeah. I think what you actually wanted is walnut room for pizza and then tracks right across exactly. the street. Yeah. They were very straight. <laughs> I could never. Um, but they were like, just like so, they're so loud, slurring everything. Sure. And it was just like hysterical. One of them, they like were trying to get in touch with whoever they knew at Dio Mio. And so they were like, FaceTiming and the person and they're like, yeah, this very nice couple with the three legged dog has been telling us that we're, <laughs> we're in the right direction. And I was like, we've told You're you like, that. Find us wherever you find your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've told you like three separate times that you're a block away, a couple blocks away. And every time you've asked me, 
you seem to not remember that we've had this conversation <laughs> and we've only walked like 200 feet. And what's so tough is in that situation, I'm sure pasta is exactly what you need. Yes. And that Dio Mio is not going to sit you. No, no. <laughs> see you. Um, but yeah, we had to like stop to let the dogs go to the bathroom. And unfortunately, that was exactly when they stopped too. I was hoping that they would just like continue on. One of them then got on a line bike. And I was like, he should not be on that bike. <laughs> he was like swerving all around I the always road. love it when they act like they're a couple fleeing yeah. like a barn fire and there's one horse. Yeah. When like the guy will get on yeah. and then the girl will like climb on behind I him. Would never. And I'm like, that's. <laughs> I had one of my friends who's a coach mm -hmm. has a former student who now works in like healthcare systems. Yeah. So many unique injuries have come out of Lime scooters yes. that the uh, healthcare system had to create a new code for electric scooter injury. <laughs> Do you know how rare it is for our healthcare system to create a new a code? A new code for they anything. They had coded everything because <laughs> that's how you charge for it. Yes, that's <laughs> And they had to create a new code. Yeah, I've heard from some healthcare people that they're like, I don't trust those scooters. I'm never getting oh, on. No. And I was like, okay. There was one summer where I was innocent and I would drive them all the time. Now I'm like, no, thank you. Casey and I have our own scooter, so you can see where we lie on that spectrum. But he was like, the guy was on the bike driving or like riding it all around. He, I don't, he didn't know where he was going. So he just went up a block, came back a block and was like, I think his, the guy's name was Marshall or something. He was like, okay. Marshall, Marshall, look, Marshall, I'm on a bike. The neighborhood you live in truly is like so the savannah funny. of drunk people in Denver. It's so funny. <laughs> it's like so everyone's funny. trying to find a water hole. And I was like cracking up and I was like maybe like five paces in front of Marshall. And Marshall was like, could tell that we were laughing at him. And he was like, don't worry, he knows how to ride a bike. <laughs> Sir, that's an electric scooter. It was a bike. It was a bike. Oh, okay, okay. It was the line bike. And then he was like, he came back around. He was like, Marshall, take a picture. <laughs> Marshall. <laughs> It's like the whole fucking thing. Forget Punxsutawney Phil. That's how you know spring is almost here. <laughs> Marshall! Someone take a picture. Look what I'm, take a picture. I can ride a bike. I'm in Rhino. <laughs> can I share, sorry, yeah. just d being drunk in an Italian restaurant. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever shared this story oh, with you. Um, I'm in Las Vegas. This is a year and a half, two years ago for someone's birthday. I'm going to keep that person anonymous, okay. but you have never met them. Okay. The story is still wonderful. Okay. So there's birthday girl, mm -hmm. who we're just going to call birthday girl. Mm -hmm. um, our other friend who lives in Seattle, and then Lydia and I. It's just the four of us in Las Vegas celebrating our girl's birthday. Yeah. And we maybe celebrated a little too hard uh, mm. in the hotel. And we were like, we need to get to our dinner reservations, which thankfully is this like Italian restaurant. Like... ASAP. If yeah. I remembered the name, I would drop it. Really did enjoy the experience. <laughs> you basically tell the waiter everything you want at once, and then they have like salad, breadsticks, like carafts of red and white wine, and then your pasta comes out, and then like uh, there's two desserts for the I table. Love a family style restaurant. Yeah, and they just kind of take care yeah, of everything. It was amazing. super nice. Yeah. Um, but we're there, and at one point, birthday girl reaches to the table to get a carafe of wine, oh, and no, we're already oh, no, like, oh, no, oh, no, no, probably not. And then she just kind of brings it. No, 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 no. Like, girl, no, no, no. We have replaced your wine with water. You don't just get to drink it out of the spigot. And so uh, the other Seattle friend removes it from her hands and like kind of puts the wine at the end of the table. And then birthday girl leans on the table and looks at me. I've kept everything anonymous yeah, so far. Yeah. She looks at me she goes across the table and she goes Grant I think I'm bisexual <laughs> and I go oh okay I could see that yeah. and she goes fuck you <laughs> and I'm like cool 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 <laughs> everyone has a journey and then what, uh, what did you want me to say we're gonna pause that story there yeah. real quick for just 10 seconds uh, fast forward 12 hours later when we're all waking up in the hotel room oh, no. and after everyone's had some water I'm like hey Hey, do you remember what you told me and the rest of the table last night? Any revisions you might want to make now? Or and she goes, I have no memory of sharing that with you or where that thought came from. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like gay, kind of gay, and Lydia, and then birthday girl. And so it's like you are, you could not be in a safer room to be like, well, didn't mean to share that truth, but there it is. Could not be in a safer it room just, to it own it. Even a it wasn't even a truth. <laughs> And like, so, in the moment, she's like, correct. that waiter is hot. <laughs> like, that's exactly it. And so then we're fast forward, sorry, back to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. We've 
figured everything out, kept the Wide lines away. away. We're walking out of the restaurant and you know three of us are still looking to have a good time and it's not like birthday girls just gonna like sit in the hotel room so we're like yeah we can kind of keep her moving yeah maybe get some like water or like sodas or something yeah, into her yeah. you know kind of sober her up a little bit and also i mean me and the other two are also kind of grooving we're all having a good time we're in a line coming out because it's a smaller sidewalk birthday girls leading the way and we just see her reach into her purse and pull something out and it's oh you guessed it um a canned tequila soda and she cracks it open and then friend number one has to go nope 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 and like passes it behind her to where lydia takes it who then passes it behind to me (laughs) the caboose and i don't love tequila but they're like grant you have to drink it or she's gonna drink it grant you have to drink it so i was like okay and i'm like (laughs) trying to like shove down this tequila canned soda oh god Um, um, and honestly, actually, wasn't that bad. It was the cut water brand. Oh, really, that's actually really, really good. delicious. I do love, yeah. But it was not in a mindset for tequila at the moment. Anyways, no idea how the rest of the night ended, but we had a blast. <laughs> <laughs> Italian restaurants are magical. <laughs> that's amazing. That's true. Yeah, the number of people that I was like, I was stone cold. I think we had like we had we had a wok beer and like so. Nice like stone cold sober right. basically and the number of people i saw at one point i was like casey did you see the girl in like the orange sweater dress and he was like i think i was paying attention to bowser like no and i was like i saw myself in her <laughs> she's so clearly like no she's hot shit mm, in the moment has yeah. maybe made out with somebody and she's just trying to act so sober <laughs> and she is not oh, <laughs> she was like not there. quite walking straight her eyes there's not really anyone home but she's walking with just so much confidence you know it's bad when you start to pull the cards close to your chest and then also be like what are these cards what have i done tonight i don't think oh, i support shit. any of those decisions <laughs> Let's go ahead and reel it back in. That means you're T-minus 30 minutes away from accidentally getting yourself into an Uber on the way home, texting your friends, I'm home, have a great night. Me. <laughs> um, the only other thing I want to share that's going on okay. in my life right now is, and we've talked about this a little bit with some of our friends on Discord, mm-hmm. I am back to running. Ah, yes. And this is the first time in like a month that I went on a run And during the run, I was like, this is good and going well. Uh, Everything up until this moment had been, it's cold and painful, and I'm not enjoying any part of this. Um, I hit five miles today, which was great. I honestly have not done that since 2023. Mm -hmm. And in addition to hitting five miles, I did get to a point where I was like, oh, yeah, I can do this. Like, I had hit my stride. I had gotten past, like, that first mental block Mm -hmm. where your brain's like, stop doing this. Yeah, we're not running from anything. (laughs) You were having coffee on the couch now we're going what is <laughs> where this? are we exactly um and so it was good and so good. let's hope that momentum continues but it went well yeah, yeah. so that's everything i in my took life. a break from running because I, my hip flexor scared the living shit what? out of me because i woke up and i don't remember if i shared this i probably shared this last when did this happen i don't know if I didn't share it, I'm sharing it now. My <laughs> butt flexor hurt like a bitch. <laughs> and I woke up like last weekend or something and I was like, maybe I shouldn't run today. Mm. And then I just didn't really work out at all this week. We had a really bad snowstorm one day and so that kept me from the gym. And then anyway, I've taken, like I, I ran once this week and now I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't do my 10K run either today or tomorrow, it's over. <laughs> I don't know what I've done to my hip flexor, but it has now happened a couple of times. That's what, 6.6 miles? uh, 6.2. 6.2? Yeah. Um, The hip flexor has happened now a couple of times, and so now I'm just convinced that it's just my life now. (laughs) And I'm just going to deal with it. And it only happens in the morning. Do you remember the very first 5K we were going to run together? And then your knee was, quote, a bag bag of of rocks. rocks. No, I was never going to run that 5K. (laughs) I knew. You're like, this is a charitable donation I have made to the center on Colfax. We're not not messing with this. So I also have been waking up with hip problems. Oh, God. Um, But I have not been entirely sure what it is. Now that I'm 30, I get to play a game of like, Guess who? And it's like, is it because it dropped in temperature degrees this week? And so now my (laughs) joints are responding. Is it because I was pushing myself on runs to get myself back up to the pace that I wanted to be Mm -hmm. at and was maybe going a little too hard? Or was I sleeping like I just wiped out on skis and then never got up? Um, I, the way I would describe the way I've slept this week, which is hard and deep. Um, it's like, (laughs) 
I, it's like I'm a Pokemon character who just got knocked out. Yeah. Like a Dragon Ball Z character about to lose the fight. Like I am, it looks like I have survived a violent accident. <laughs> and that is where you found my body. And then I'm wrapped up in some really nice olive sheets. Um, it's a vibe. But so it. I'm like, what is the reason my body hurts? Mm-hmm. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't either. And I was, I was at work this week and talking to one of my friends about it. And she was like, I was like, yeah, I like woke up like almost in tears because it hurt so bad and I couldn't fall back asleep. And then she was like, oh yeah, my dad was like a heavy runner and now he like, his hip flexor hurts all the time and my mom wants him to get a new hip, but he won't. And I was like, was that supposed to help me? Because now I just know this is a problem. Right. Forever. Right. Thank you? Like what? (laughs) Yeah, sometimes you just don't ever bounce back. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> she was like, he goes to a physical therapist. And yeah. And he manages it. Yeah, I was like, what? It's okay. I, I've seen him smile sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, now I'm like, now I know that it's like such a thing that like, it's not an injury I can recuperate Mm-mm. from. Oh, girly. Yeah, you are absolutely getting to the permanent marker stage of adulthood. All of that beautiful little cartilage you had in your 20s, early oh, yeah, 20s, gone. teens. It's gone. It's been gone since my knee was a bag of rocks, uh, to be fair. My, like, my skin won't even fully heal sometimes. If I get a really bad cut, right? Like, obviously, it'll, like, paper it over. But the reminder's there. You know, you're going to see it now. Oh, you scar? That's crazy. Oh, for sure. Not emotionally. <laughs> but uh, physically, yeah. For sure, yes. <laughs> so that is uh, my life in a nutshell right now. Sp- a week away from spring break. Yeah. And I'm ready for it. Yeah. Um, Casey and I did a photo shoot yesterday, which Thank was you. so fun. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, this, this little these little flowers behind me are from the florist. Y'all, the photos are so cool. I didn't want to bring it up because it's not my story. So cool. I'm obsessed. I've only seen photos from two of the photographers. It was like a photography workshop, yeah. and we got picked by like the event planner to be some of the models, and so we got the photo, some of the photos from the lead photographer and then some from one of the people who attended. But it was like just to help vendors advertise their stuff for weddings. And so there was like a florist, uh, like party rentals. Um, the bridal shop that I got the dress from is obviously, like we got those dresses for free just to advertise them and they obviously went back to the store, but which is sad, I missed that dress. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can I share something real quick? Yeah. You, uh, either sent me the photos or yeah. I saw them on Instagram without telling me what it was yeah. specifically. And I know, at least right now, what your wedding plans are. And they don't necessarily involve a huge white dress. No. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I, I, think, I, I think I missed an update or two. <laughs> But that's cool. The number the, of people that responded that were like, did you get married? I was like, no, I did not. My favorite photos are the ones where you guys are like staged around the table mm-hmm. and you're sitting in front so of the table. Good. Friends, the way I would describe it is it's giving like Neo Marie Antoinette, but mm-hmm. when she's at like the height of her girl mm-hmm. boss, not like the pit of her execution. Yes. Like absolutely Just let like them extravagance, eat cake. yes. So the gorgeous, theme though. was uh Wes Anderson meets oh, for sure. um, Meow Wolf. And so it was like oh, a lot of nice, like nice, neon nice. stuff. And so but the, the way the photos were staged, absolutely were Wes so Anderson. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's one photographer that was there who like loved Wes Anderson and she had Casey and I do like a bunch of like very typical Wes Anderson shots and I'm nice. so excited to see those. Anyway, these flowers are from a vendor called Blumen House and the photo, or like these at least, are actually, they're like not painted. Yeah, they're all real flowers. This is a real oh, flower cool. too. And so she uses like dye and stuff to make them oh. those colors. I think that one is somewhat painted. Yeah, the that particular, she had a bunch of different. I have glitter now on my hand for the rest of my life. Did you think the <laughs> glitter came naturally? No, I just thought it was more attached to the plant. No. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, I got now my. Now it's on my other hand. It's fine, I'm gay. <laughs> Let me get it underneath my eyes real quick. Have you seen the, this <laughs> video of this guy who's being ready. interviewed by the news? And he's like, ma- the, the headline is like, man found dead in a park. And the news, and the guy's talking and he's from like a LARPing group playing D&D. And they're like, yeah, I think the cops got mad at us for like tampering with the crime scene because my friend who's like the medic tried to get him up and no. apparently uh, like glitter is t- no <laughs> tried to use like a certain spell that had a lot of glitter or whatever it is and it's just like a glitter bomb <laughs> it's a dead body 
This is like a comedy sketch skit, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, um, getting my hair and makeup professionally done was uh, a real ego boost. So. It looked fantastic. Anyway. Speaking of the news, and mm-hmm. I think this is probably the last thing on my agenda before okay. we hear today's story. Yeah. Friends, we are on the Kate Middleton case. <laughs> we have been tagged more times so than anybody else times. in the Agatha Christie Kate Middleton TikTok this video. This is the kind of social media Keep attention I love. Yo, absolutely. Keep doing it. Thank you. No one's bullied us. Everyone thinks we're creative. Those are the correct answers. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, are, we are on it. We are wrapped. At one point yesterday during the debate tournament, I uh, had a friend turn off all the lights, turn on their projector, and then projected a seven-minute TikTok video about <laughs> Kate Middleton's timeline. Um, we're on it, and when we have answers, you'll be the first to know. I'm dying to know, frankly. What's so fun is we are recording this on St. Patrick's Day, yeah. so it's what, March 16th? I can fucking tell you. Yeah. 17th. Is. Oh, I was so close. Uh, it's March 17th, so in three weeks when this episode's live, we might have a lot more answers, yeah. but right now we don't. <laughs> ah. So it's all conjecture. I did I say the name of the vendor? I don't know. The vendor for the flowers is Bloomin' House. I don't know if I got sidetracked mm. in the middle of a sentence. You that might happens have. That sounds kind of familiar. Yeah. But. Anyway, that's that. Uh, yeah, as soon as the AI photo came out, I was like... Oh my God. The second they shared it on CNN, it was before it came out that it was like clearly edited. I was right. looking at it and I was like, it do- it's his so uncanny weird. valley. Yes. Yeah, his fingers were weird. I don't understand why everyone looked so happy. It was very strange. Well, and then the response of, sorry, this is Kate. Sometimes I use Photoshop. The Royals don't have any passwords. They don't have any accounts. They're the last people who are truly disconnected from any social media apps. Mm-hmm. Um She's not sitting down with Adobe Flash trying to edit this year's Christmas She's cards. Like, like a lot of creators, I like to play with Photoshop. Like, what? <laughs> what? My first also, thought. Also, you're going to play with Photoshop on the I'm alive photo? On the don't have to worry about yeah. my whereabouts photo? Incorrect. That's the photo Wrong you're going to play around assumption. with? assumption. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so as soon as they were like, AP like rescinded the photo, I was like, oh, yeah. girl. Yeah. You done hecked it. I'm trying to decide if it's a responsible thing or not to show my students that video this week as a way of teaching them researching skills. I think That's fair. probably not, but it has crossed my mind. Will you send me that video? Yeah, 100% okay. I will. I actually am kind of shocked I haven't already. You might have, and I just might okay. have missed it. Cool, That's cool, cool. super fair. <laughs> um, okay. Ready to teach me something? Yeah. Hooray! Yes, yes, so- yes. <laughs> This story, uh, I knew kind of, so, I don't remember if I cut it or not. I did say at some point I wanted to do a true crime story this episode. Unfortunately, Grant made the theme out and about, which is just vague enough. Okay. Which I had to do a serial killer if I'm doing out and about. Like, what other other crime can I cover? (laughs) It just, like, none of it would have, like, fit well enough for me to be happy with it. And I tried. How on earth do you get serial killer out without and about. an about? Oh my god. They're out on the town. <laughs> they're escaping the law. No, I'm laughing at the way you just said it. Because they're out and about. They're out and about. <laughs> Grant? When I named the theme, I was like, is it too gay? I don't care. Out and about. And you were like, thank you so much. This person murdered everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so as soon as you said yours was like gay history, I was like, okay, that makes way more sense. And so I texted Grant. I was like, can I also do a queer topic? Because that yes. seems like the only correct answer to this theme. It, and it was. And it's true. It was. Don't worry. Next theme will be true crime. Next oh, story will be true crime. Is this not going to be a serial killer? Are you not telling us about a serial no. killer? Oh, I thought I was prepared to hear a lot of people die tonight. No. And so I was like, wow, that is absolutely no. a turn. Oh, wow. Okay, so one. I asked you if I could do a queer story. Yeah, and no, you and said I said yes. yes. And then do you remember what else you said? No. Okay, so then after that, you were like, LOL, JK, never mind. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not. I'll let you know, or I won't. Like, it was. You, you the res- answer was I didn't. You rescinded everything you had told me about. And so I was, I was just, back to zero. I was just anxious. <laughs> so this is a story that I we've talked about. I remember when a we used bit. to tell each other our stories before we recorded. Yeah, that's crazy that we did that. <laughs> Why would we ever? It's crazy to think that we had our stories ready to go up until the minute before we were going to record. I was literally, ed- I was literally <laughs> finishing my notes until basically Grant came. When he te- when I confirmed the time today, he said maybe a little earlier, and I just never responded because <laughs> I was Correct. like, 
No. <laughs> we literally cannot. I can always tell when you need a little bit more time because I don't get a text at 1.30 like, you on your way? Yeah. Um, I was like, oh, okay, I can, I, yeah. I can finish it. I was wrapping up <laughs> the rest of the story. Wait, so we're going to hear something gay? Something gay, I'm yes. I'm so excited. This is a story that I wanted to cover, and in truth, I wanted to cover it more broadly than I did today. Today, I kind of like ended up narrowing it just because I like... I asked a little lost in the sauce. So, no, that's, I think, great. Yeah. It's the repeated joke, overcook, undercook, which overcook, is a Fred Armisen yes, exactly. character. Yes. I think I uh, went too broad you on were, mine. Yeah, I yeah, think I was very broad. And so I love broad. that we're very specific okay. on this one. This one is, it's going to start out pretty broad and then it's going to really narrow in because I was doing a, a lot of like vague research and then I found something and I was like, well, this is it. And then yesterday at the, sh- at the photo shoot, Casey was like bored while I was getting my makeup done. And he, I was like, you can help me finish my research. If it's April. Abraham Lincoln, I'm going to freak out. (laughs) I'm so excited to learn. I'm so excited for history. It's fun when you do a history episode. Um, And I'm so glad that it's going to be a little queer. So this this first part of the story, I put in exclusively because I always ask Grant a question at the beginning. And I wasn't about to not do that. And so what I'm about to talk about, there's a lot more to. And I'm not going to get into it because I finished this part at 15 minutes before Grant came. So the story yes. is going to begin in 1989 in okay. Florida with okay. a young boy named Joshua Eads Brown. Okay. Okay. I was worried he would recognize the name. He didn't. Uh, Joshua goes with his only friend, uh, who is his neighbor. He, he himself says only friend. And uh, to see a brand new movie, The Little Mermaid. Oh, cute. Yeah. His friend is a young redheaded girl. Oh, 1989. Wow. Okay. I know. Sorry. I didn't know that either. I thought it was later. Uh, well, the article that I read said 1980s. And then I was like, what year did this actually come out? Right. And I was when like, 89. And I was like, it came out in November of 1989. So I was like, <laughs> the last month. So literally, of 89. 89. Like, <laughs> It's not the 80s. <laughs> anyway, uh, so his friend is a young redheaded girl who saw herself in Ariel and Classic. wanted to be her, obviously. Joshua didn't particularly resonate with any characters in the same way until, and this is a quote from them, then, all of a sudden, the most gorgeous creature I've ever seen turns around. Hell yeah. That's how I felt about Ursula. <laughs> yes. I didn't really understand why I was so obsessed with her immediately. I thought, you're the complete antithesis of everything I've ever been told is attractive. You're fat, you're an octopus, your hair is short, and you're wearing too much makeup. So here's a fact. That's the end of that quote. Uh, <laughs> here's a fact that was speculated for a long time, but never really confirmed until relatively recently. Ursula took heavy inspiration from Divine. Right. Yes, I I wrote a lot of words. Okay. Fra- took heavy inspiration from the drag queen Divine, and she was a triple threat. He was a triple threat. Uh, Divine was born in 1945 and died of heart failure in 1988, and is remembered today for his fierce refusal to abide by beauty standards of being glamorous and feminine, even among the drag community or the drag queen community. So she was a drag queen, but like kind of a butcher drag queen. Not necessarily butcher, but like more proud of being like fat, short hair, uh, like she owned Hell yeah. what she looked like. And that was like not necessarily drag queens have will like completely alter their faces, right. you know, and like Well, if, I mean, as we covered last week for yeah. you guys last yeah. week, um, like there was kind of like this debutante ball mm-hmm. aspect to it. And there's that still exists, mm-hmm. but yes, like very feminine yes. presenting. Yeah. And so Divine really opened up the possibilities of what drag could become. So, Grant, yes. your question today. Do you know who Joshua Eads Brown is? Joshua who? Eads Brown. Mm-hmm. Who they might be. Who they might be. They competed um, on a TV show. Oh. And they love drag queens. So, in my head right now, it's like RuPaul. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not Trixie Mattel, mm-hmm. uh, but maybe Katya. I, I don't know. It is uh, Joshua Eads Brown would go on to place as a runner up on season seven of RuPaul's Drag Race under the name Ginger Minj. Oh, fun. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Since this, Ginger Minj has acted in major movies like Dumplin', Hocus Pocus yes. 2. They've written a cookbook and released a number of studio albums. Dolly Parton also stars in Dumplin', and it's, she's so great. I love Dolly. You've heard that Dolly Parton once came in third in a Dolly Parton lookalike contest, right? <laughs> Have you not heard that? 
That's and, so funny. And she has said before, if I had to be like reincarnated and come back to Earth, I'd come back as a drag queen. <laughs> like I she love is, her. she's uh, our Tennessee queen, mm-hmm. um, who is just an, a fierce ally of I love the community. Her so. <laughs> so Divine and Ginger Minge. Uh, Their careers have been defined by exploring what drag can be, and drag culture itself has been defined by acts of rebellion against norms and standards. Right. Today, we are covering drag. Oh, like the history of drag. Yeah, kind of. And then we're going to get really specific into one particular person (laughs) because there's so much. (laughs) So today's sources are the National Geographic, the DCist, NPR, Washington Blade, Smithsonian, CNN, National Archives, Tales of Times Forgotten, PBS, um, the American Academy of Berlin, Time Magazine, and Today. Can I just pause real quick here? Mm-hmm. Um, we've gotten a couple people who are like, I love how long your guys' episodes are. And I think it's because you and I regularly turn to so many sources. So many. Like, if I'm only using five sources before I come here, yeah. I'm like, oh, it's kind of a it light story. Feel right. And I think it's because we've kind of gotten yeah. used to, like, we need to really know what we're about to say before we say it. Someone's like, going to come for us. Correct. And they do. They do. They and do. so we, we have to, Keep like, really it, yeah. research it. And then in that researching process, we're like, oh, well, that's interesting. And so, like, <laughs> Maya and I really are producing, like, two book reports a week. <laughs> that, like, <laughs> like, I'm, like, I'm not joking. Like, yeah. when we have a uh, when we have an episode that we have to put together that week, there's probably, like, three to five hours of researching. At if least, I can yeah. find a documentary, amazing, because then I can research and do something else at the same time. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is Ginger Minj. I love it. This is Divine. I love, wow, There's that is... So much that like is, Ursula. That is, like, that is Ursula. It is Ursula. I had to remember that this photo was taken before Ursula comes out because it looks like Divine is doing an Ursula impersonation. It almost does, When really it is the other way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is her performing in 1983. So yes, before. And then uh, to relate to Ginger Minj for one second, Mm -hmm. I think I shared this on the pod already, but it happened many, many episodes ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the first moments that I truly knew I was of the community (laughs) was when I was watching the movie Emperor's New Groove. Yes. And I was, and I did not understand why, obsessed with Yzma. As you should. You're right. As like you, you have um, Kronk, right? Mm-hmm. Like poster child, the like beta version of um, Golden Retriever Boy yes. energy. Mm-hmm. And I'm just obsessed with Yzma, her energy, no, her, her charisma, mm-hmm. her like villainous side to her. She's my favorite. It should have yeah. been a sign, oh, right? It's I that meme. That my son can't be gay. He loves women. The women my son loves. Yeah. <laughs> it's Yzma. Yzma. Literally. I for a second wanted to do like talking about queer coded villains in yes. Disney, but that was after I did all of this and then I was like we don't we don't have the time <laughs> <laughs> I then might jump in every now and then yeah. with some uh, Disney gay coded villain history yeah. we had a kid do a speech on it on the speech Ooh. team a couple years ago yeah I honestly I'm like I'm a lover of learning because Love between it. this <laughs> and then speech and debate I'm just constantly learning, learning about shit. new yeah, stuff yeah that's crazy. Okay. I have a lot of thoughts on public shame and nihilism this year because of the speeches we're running The nihilism one got me, (laughs) man. Okay, so the history of drag is quite muddled due to its stigma, much like what Grant talked about last week of the speculation surrounding gay women in history. There's just, like, because it was stigmatized, because they weren't necessarily in the spotlight, there wasn't a whole lot of, like record about them um and it's a similar with drag because it was so stigmatized people tried to hide the fact that they were involved in this kind of queer culture that there's not a whole lot about it especially once we get into the 1900s and like late 1800s so some argue that drag became began in ancient greece and rome when men would portray female female characters um this was also an aspect of kabuki theater in japan in the 1600s and pecking opera performances in the 1700s uh and shakespearean performances yeah, in england that's what i was about to get to oh, oh, that's sorry. literally my next line Grant. Sorry. i'm just like yes 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 yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. tell me everything it's gay and theater are now yes <laughs> So this was also common in Elizabethan theater with Shakespearean productions. Um, Other historians believe that the origin of drag is much more modern. Lady J, who is a drag performer with a doctorate in musicology, uh, focused on drag history, uh, says that it debuted in 1860s Victorian England with Ernest Bolton of the Bolton and Park duo uh, when they described his act of cross-dressing as drag potentially the first known use of the term. Um, However, there's a lot of argument about what that first um, use of the term was. Drag could also be uh, inspired by the petticoats men would wear that would drag on the floor as they performed on stage. 
So I, for a long time, mm-hmm. did not know that this style of performance was called drag. drag. In fact, I knew about RuPaul's Drag Race before, like a day or two yeah. before I knew that like the art itself was called drag. Uh-huh. And like RuPaul's Drag Race involves RuPaul holding the, like the checkered flags. flags. I've always so got I, confused. Right, yeah. I was like, how is this related to cars at all? Same. I do not get it. I was I learned, always so confused. That's the pervasive power of RuPaul's yeah. Drag Race is I knew what drag race was before, before I knew what drag, drag was. racing was. Right, exactly. At the <laughs> and that's how I learned. It's Lifelong true. learner. I don't think I really, I think I knew that there was like drag as like, I'm talking about it today, and drag as in drag car racing. Right. And I never really processed that they weren't somehow related. <laughs> that they're one word, two uses. Yes. It's like, well, they, they must do the performance before the race starts, yes? Overcook, undercook. Overcook, <laughs> Um, So around this time, 1860s in the U.S., men would impersonate women in racist minstrel shows. Mm. Super fun. White actors would wear blackface to portray racial stereotypes of African Americans. Uh, There's a common character of the Yaller Girl, L or sorry, Y A L L E R, um, which was portrayed by a man dressed as a light-skinned woman. As vaudeville performances began, became more popular in the 1880s, these portrayals shifted to glamorous white women with uh, tight waists and elegant makeup. I'm not sure what word I was supposed to put there. Mm. but um, And kind of the first person who was really well known was Julian Eltinge. I don't think this person is gay, but he was a silent film superstar. Oh. So that's uh, him as... Out of drag. Out of drag, and that's him in, in drag. drag. Yeah. Um, so yeah, silent films were kind of made around Hold the on, time. Can I see this photo one yeah, more yeah. time? Go for it. I was going to say keep going, but I realized oh, I have your notes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a black and white photo. Yeah. but They're th- wearing like a beautiful dress, hose. Their hair is done up. Yeah. And like an updo. I think they're in heels. No, the a fantastic I know, presentation. Right? Yes. <laughs> Which is like, because like, part of it is, is like, is this Hollywood dressing him up in this way? Yeah. It's not like there's like YouTube tutorials of like how to... How to put on makeup. I don't know yeah. if you had this as part of your childhood, mm. but so much gay learning happens on the internet which is like cool because you can find your community and then bad because there's no one there to help like guide you through it's all like that information yeah, yeah, there's yeah, like yeah. misinformation and like toxicity like, in the community there's but... this t- or Instagram account that I found recently it just keeps showing up on my F- or right. for you page but it's like uh, if only there was a like Instagram account to show you how things work but it's not just how te- it's not telling you how anything works it's just showing you something working or like being made oh, and it's, it's just like, like here's a perfectly operating machine yeah it's like <laughs> so, so um, yeah like if only <laughs> i really do think the like how to videos um mm-hmm. were like i have no research to back this up before mm-hmm. i say this this is projection yeah but i really do think it was like the makeup girlies and the gays who like found spaces online yeah and then the how-to videos became popular and then they expanded to the point now the thing i was trying to build up to uh we know people in our lives let's keep them nameless who uh have watched enough youtube videos that they're like pretty sure they could build an a-frame cabin <laughs> so if you have any tips please write in on <laughs> how to stop your friends from building, building an, an a-frame, a-frame cabin, cabin. <laughs> and if you are our friend no do it we believe right, in exactly. you it just gets to the situation where it's like I'm expected to step into it or tell them after it's done I don't, I don't believe it's safe. I, I'm not stepping into it. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um, outside of the theater where this kind of cross-dressing was perceived as normal um, there are also drag balls emerging in the US largely attributed to who we're going to talk about which was the self-described queen of drag Okay. Um, per vanity legend. No, Van- this is a different note that I wrote before I got into the rest of this. <laughs> this is Vanity Legend. Oh, not the magazine, but not I the performer. The, I think this Amazing. is Vanity Legend okay. performing somewhere. Love Obviously, this is a colored photo. Right. And the person that we're going to talk about was around like the 1880s. Oh. So this is later. 
<laughs> you can tell how my notes proceeded. The first half like, of these notes is absolutely red string tying yeah, things like, together as we get to. I also to, wrote this like forever ago. It's also okay. so funny that I made a red string reference when I thought this episode was about to be about a serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Okay. So who was the first drag queen? Um, we don't really know since the participation of um, being in these drag mm. shows and drag balls was so t- stigmatized and risky. So before we get into drag balls, what is drag really? Is it just cross-dressing? Is it uh, attending these drag balls? Um, so some historians believe when looking through the lens of history that drag is really just cross-dressing, but others say that it needs to be way more specific. Specifically, they say it requires two key elements. One, an intentional celebration of gender expression, mm. and two, competition, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so it's American. Yes, it's American. It's capitalism. We have an Australian friend, and we had to explain to them how big St. Patrick's Day is in here. But we, <laughs> That's really funny. we have to keep explaining to this Australian friend how big things are yeah. in American, and I don't just mean the soda size, which everyone knows, mm-hmm. but I'm like, we don't, we're just not a casual culture. No, we, we do things all the way, and usually they're irrelevant things, exactly. ironically. Um, so other historians also say, or other historians, like historian Kathleen Casey, who is author of The Prettiest Girl on Stage is a Man, which I just wrote because I thought it was a That's hilarious a great book name. Title. Yeah. Uh, Race and Gender Benders in American Vaudeville. Uh, Kathleen believes that drag is about, is quote, about race, class, and sexuality as much as it is about gender. If we focus exclusively Mm. on one of these intersections, we fail to see how drag performances are layered across time and space and can have multiple meanings for different audiences. So drag is really about a performer's own perspective of their work as well as an audience's understanding of their work, kind of in relation to the time period that they're in, which is kind of why I started with Ursula and Ginger Minj in that they were still redefining what drag was. So I mean this both yeah. in a funny way, but also sincerely. Okay. The real drag is the art we made along the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since they've been able to actually stop you with a comment for a second. This is actually bringing a lot of joy to me. I just panic that you're looking at me and you're gonna like tell me I was absolutely wrong and out of line. You're like, Grant, I don't think it's funny. I was panicked for a second. <laughs> then you said something funny. That's another she reason I struggled I'm funny. with this story. I was like, am I, should I, should I tell this story? Yes. And then I yes. Did, yeah, I just kept going. Um, so, yeah, if you have corrections, let me, let me know. Um, and then I'll respond. Yeah, perfect. So, drag balls. Um happened around this time in the U.S. So, many contemporary LGBTQ plus Labels and terms date back to the 1800s. For example, lesbian was first used in a medical journal in 1883, Mm. um, among other things that I didn't get into. So the term drag is potentially another potential source of the term drag is derived from a grand rag. Rag being an old term for masquerade balls um, and grand just being like big. Drag may also refer to the long dresses that would drag across the stage that we talked about already. Okay. Drag balls are largely attributed to black and Latino performers. Especially around this time, it was like community building, especially Mm. for these already marginalized communities. So um, black and Latino performers were excluded from drag performances that were considered white only, or if they were allowed to participate in these performances, they were prevented from winning. Sure. And so they started um, making their own ways to celebrate making their own yeah. competitions making that their own then competitions. probably end up better and more interesting and creative yeah in the process that's crazy how that works and how it's still that way in some <laughs> circles yes. yeah so black drag artists began to host their own competitions um annual galas in new york city's harlem and william dorsey swan's dance parties in washington dc are the two original sources of drag balls and so we're gonna get into William Dorsey Swan. So when are these drag balls happening specifically? They started in the 1880s. Okay, so we're mm-hmm. going... Way back. We have, we have really been kind of stuck in the Gilded Age for a little yep. bit. <laughs> My stories. So Oops. at the same time the Haymarket Riot is happening yeah. in Chicago, mm-hmm. you have... Um, these drag balls, balls happening, happening in New York yeah. City. I think that's really, I think that's really interesting. It's, the culture is crazy, dude. Um, so earlier I mentioned that 
uh, Lady J, a drag, the drag performer, kind of believed that drag debuted in the 1860s with Ernest Bolton of the Bolton and Park duo. So these two, Ernest Bolton, who was known as Stella, and then Frederick Park, who was known as Fanny, um, they were, in 1871, two members of the British aristocracy. Oh. I said it right, too. I, said it, I put a little <laughs> Sorry, pronunciation I'm trying, I'm trying, guide. I, <laughs> I forgot my gold stars. Thank you. I won't forget next, next time, week, of thank course. You. <laughs> I had no idea you'd been practicing. <laughs> I did. I spent a good, like, two minutes air, air, in the, aristocracy. In the mirror, like, yeah. watching your tongue. Aristocracy. Aristoc- Aristoc- oh, shit. Gosh, darn it. <laughs> harder. Harder A. Air. Air. Uh, okay. So in early uses of the word drag, um, in this case, it referred to a gathering of people, particularly men who were dressing as women. So again, it's just kind of hearkening back to drag just being defined as sure. cross-dressing. In the 1880s. In the 18, This is 1870. Okay. Um, but yes. So Ernest Bolton and Frederick Park, Stella and Fanny, were charged with, quote, conspiring and inciting persons to commit an unnatural offense mm-hmm. after being caught dressing as women in public. They were found not guilty, but they were. There was a minor indictment handed down, and I, I'm not sure if they spent any time uh, in in jail or whatever. Uh, so, this is a picture of Ernest oh, and Frederick dressed as uh, Stella and Fanny, and then this is them as men. These two in the back holding mallets. Okay. I don't know. It's just hilarious Wait, to see these so pictures. So these, these are still them as well? Yeah. In the back holding mallets? Yeah. I What's so funny is, so today's drag, like, a lot of the looks are, like, skin tight and, like, yes. kind of revealing. And they're very, like, kind of modern or even kind of, like, futuristic in yeah. nature. And, like, these two people would have been saved from the Titanic. Yeah, like, these they, two people, like, just look <laughs> like women. Like, they are absolutely picking up their dresses and there's still f- seven more layers no, of fabric that, behind Underneath that, yeah. It's, them. like, it's so interesting to see how drag's kind of transformed from, like, yes. ju- literally just cross-dressing kind of like this to what it is now like this before. but yeah. if you go to this picture right next to it too like there's so much fun in this photo like yeah. there's so much mischief going on it's i'm you, confused as to what's going on exactly in this photo. also you think of like you know people in the 1880s 1870s yeah. 1890s it wasn't a long time ago cultural norms were different surely they would have all been more conservative mm-hmm. less open-minded less you know like yeah. able to engage but Everyone in this photo is clearly like in on it. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. It's, I love this It looks kind of like a family photo for those of you who yes. are listening. There's like a, an older gentleman and woman sitting in front and then another man kind of off to the side and then Ernest and Frederick are just like <laughs> in the back holding mallets. I don't know which one's Ernest and which one's Frederick, but uh, of the pair, the one on the right that's holding a mallet <laughs> is absolutely giving eyes to, <laughs> to the, the camera. camera. <laughs> and then the one on the left is like threatening to like, it looks like hammer someone to death. <laughs> man, yeah. And they're, but it's such a fun photo. It's hilarious, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> um, and then beginning in the 1880s, so these two were kind of out and about in the 60s and 70s. Um, beginning in the 1880s, laws were passed in cities all across the country. Uh, I think I'm talking about the U.S. here, uh, explicitly banning cross-dressing. But these laws were really applied selectively, and they were riddled with inconsistencies and contradictions. They're much like some laws that we're seeing today Mm. about, like, abortion um, that are just, like, clearly used in a lot of senses to control. And, like, because something is upsetting someone else on a moral level. I'm going to force you to deviate towards what I think is socially acceptable as opposed to having, like, a free and open society. Exactly, yeah. Yes. So now we're going to come back to the U.S., uh, to William Dorsey Swan. Uh, This is going to take us to 1863. Civil War, baby! (laughs) Can't get away from it. Grant, what happened on January 1st, 1863? January 1st, 1863? Well, of course, 1863 began. Sorry. I'm really disappointed in you right now. Um, January 1st, 1863. There's something that was signed. Oh, is it the Emancipation yeah. Proclamation? Yeah. Nice, the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln. <laughs> Hell yeah. Fan I favorite. was right. I was right. Found family trope. Yeah. He's a member. <laughs> uh, Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation. But do you know what he signed eight months prior to this on April 16th, 1862? I don't. 
the D.C. Compensated Emancipation Proclamation, which ended slavery in the District of Columbia. Okay, that's actually really interesting, mm-hmm. because when he signs the Emancipation Proclamation, mm-hmm. his three moments, sorry, you know the curse of my history degree. Uh, when he signs the Emancipation Proclamation, it only declares an end to slavery in rebellious mm-hmm. states. Yeah. And so you have states of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, mm-hmm. which still allowed the institution of slavery, but had not joined the Confederacy. Mm. And in those four, what were called border states, the institution of slavery would Was, continue beyond it. Ugh. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I didn't know that D.C. technically had an Emancipation Proclamation before the, like, the Emancipation Proclamation, which I thought was interesting. So, um, <laughs> beginning in 1866, so uh, four years later, African Americans in D.C. celebrated April 16th as Emancipation Day. Oh, cool. And they would celebrate with parades and festivals. At these parades, each neighborhood would be represented by a woman who personified freedom for black people. And these were considered the queens of freedom. And it's unsure if there was like a winner of these women or if it was like all of them were crowned queens, sure. but they were known as the queens of freedom. Um, the signing of the DC Compensated Emancipation Proclamation uh, freed more than 3,000 enslaved people wow. and drew thousands of black Americans to Washington. So DC uh, would then become a center of black political, intellectual, and cultural life. Uh, between 1860 and 1870, the black population tripled in size from 14,000 to 43,000. Wow. It's always interesting because I, I have been to D.C. a number of times and I've always been a little like, not shocked, but like I wasn't, I've never been expecting it to be as diverse sure. as it is. And I'm always like kind of impressed by how racially diverse it is. And that I feel like this it's, probably has some, lays some of the foundation for that. It's really racially yeah. diverse. It's also really racially segregated mm-hmm. as a yeah, lot yeah, of yeah. American cities are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, for obvious reasons, DC's portrayal in national media, yeah. even like in fiction, right? It's like in shows, white, is yeah. like, well, it's why it's like the center of politics, like the right, presence yeah. there, things like that. But it's a majority black city. Yeah. And one of the crazy. things that people have brought up as to why DC still hasn't been granted statehood yet mm-hmm. is that DC would be America's first or second majority or plurality black state in the country. Um, hmm. And when I, so I spent. This is like a lifetime ago now. Yeah. But when I was in college, I spent a summer interning in Washington, mm-hmm. D.C., and I lived in this town home with like 14 other people. Side story. <laughs> We've told not. it. Okay, yeah. sweet. Amazing. Yeah. Good. Oh, literally last week. That's fun. <laughs> um, great. Uh, but... The park, most of the row homes were dedicated to, like, ambassadors, politicians, or, like, intern housing. Mm -hmm. And then exactly at the end of the park, the neighborhood became essentially, like, 100% black. Um, And it was just kind of shocking to see, like, one street where the dividing line literally occurred. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is kind of nuts. Um, So... William Dorsey Swan was born as an enslaved person in Maryland in 1858 as the fifth of 13 children. Wow. Uh, born to an enslaved housekeeper, Mary Jane Yunker, and enslaved farmer and musician Andrew Jackson, hilarious, uh, <laughs> whose name, they called him Jack Swan. Uh, there was a chance Jack may have been white, but this has never mm. been confirmed, like conclusively confirmed. Uh, William, when William was about seven or eight, the Civil War ended and his parents uh, were able to buy some land and begin their own farm. Uh, his first job was at a hotel, as a hotel waiter. He was kind of encouraged to start working as soon as he could to sure. like, help support the family. With 13 siblings, yeah. yeah. Holy fucking shit, dude. <laughs> uh, and in 1880, he ro- relocated to Washington, D.C., where he got a job as a janitor and he sent money back home to his family in Maryland. Mm. So in D.C., Lafayette Square, uh, which is near the White House, was known as a cruising spot for gay men. Still is. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that was my question. <laughs> Got it answered. I knew I didn't need that to look it up. And a DuPont Circle. You're yep. like, oh, Grant's coming over later. Yeah, I can just ask Grant. Know. <laughs> if you want a $22 cocktail <laughs> and a drink. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> DuPont Circle. Anyways, go yes. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so it was known as a cruising spot for gay men, both black and white or Latino, any any race, really. Um, but as though, even though multiple races came there to meet, they often kept their encounters within their own race, so mm. still segregated. And so drag balls, once they started happening, were an exception to this trend. All races were kind of invited. I think it was majority of my, like minority black races. Yeah, sure. black people. Um, so William, when I lived in DC, it had such a great nighttime community. 
plenty of establishments. One of the best <laughs> places, I, I don't need to say the names, but I'm pretty sure it's closed. Mm-hmm. One of the best gay dance clubs I've ever been oh, to yeah? was in D.C. like oh. six, seven, eight years ago. It was a blast and a half. And I thought uh, it closed at two because that's what... Uh, it makes sense. That's when uh, bars close everywhere Here, yeah. else. And in Lincoln, no, three. So you know that moment where you like finish your last drink and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be ready to go now. Like, hit it, yeah. right? And they're like, oh, no, we got another hour. And now you're scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was DC. Also, for a long time, DC had the highest percentage of reported gay people oh. because of the government offices that worked there. Oh. Like, if you climbed up the ladder, um, you oftentimes got relocated to DC to work for your senator yeah. or to work for the department. And shocking, uh, gay people are really competitive a what? lot of times. No. <laughs> we oftentimes take our internalized homophobia and make it other people's problems <laughs> by running for class president. <laughs> And that starts a long journey of being up to other people's business. What did we say? The two key elements of drag work? <laughs> and I'm proud no. to be a homosexual. <laughs> or at least I know I'm better than you. No, I'm kidding. Singing podcast. Uh, <laughs> I'm making it a real. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's fine. It'll be ready in time for pride. <laughs> I'll save it to post on Pride. So no, that no, way no, save it, repost it mm, on perfect, Pride. Perfect. Absolutely. Are you kidding? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jesus. I'm loving it. Thank you for doing this because it's giving me the chance to do the kind of color commentary. Yeah. It's hard for me to do when I have to tell the story. It's true. But as long as you remember where we're at, I can say whatever I want. <laughs> there are no rules. We live in a lawless society. God, I do need to get back to DC soon. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> The way he was holding his drink was hysterical. Okay, so William Dorsey Swan began hosting Drag Balls in 1882. Uh, It's not really known if he was the first to host Drag Balls. Mm. Um, We'll get into why we know he hosted Drag Balls in a second, but it is thought he is probably... One of the first. One of the first, if not the first. Sure. So uh, he actually spent a short time in jail around the time that he started hosting these drag balls for stealing party supplies. (laughs) Party City does not play around. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, well, I need plates. (laughs) Yeah. Who else has helium at this hour? Yeah. (laughs) What am I supposed to do? Exactly. Um, Yeah, so Swan hosted the first documented drag balls. We uh, we don't know about any undocumented (laughs) drag balls. That sounds weird. Okay. Uh, Word would spread about these events at places like the YMCA. Yes. Uh, Many guests... uh, You're going to make me say it. Yeah, do it. You know what the song It's Fun to Stay at the YMCA is about, right? Oh, shit. Yeah, I heard about this. It's about gay homelessness. Yeah. See, before the YMCA was just the place that you went to work out because your family had a budget. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, in part, a shelter for the unhoused. It was like a homelessness shelter. That's crazy. And it was located in many U.S. cities. Remember when and we, our Airbnb in London was right across the street from the first YMCA? Uh, oh, that's right. <laughs> and both of us were like, <laughs> wait, what? This is an American institution. (laughs) Did the Boy Scouts of America also get started in the West End? (laughs) Hell. But no, it was, so, I mean, this is still true today, but this has kind of always been true, that gay people are overrepresented in Mm -hmm. the population of homeless people or the unhoused. Um, And so that meant they, at times, were a significant portion of those staying at places like the YMCA. And so that's why it was fun to stay Stay at at the the YMCA. YMCA. Because you had a place to stay yeah and also there was a bunch of other gay people there Mm. it's kind of a song about hooking up at the ymca and they have children dance to it at basketball (laughs) games i'm proud to be (laughs) a A homosexual well at least i know i'm better than you (laughs) You're right, you're no, right. Was, so we sorry. were at a tournament one time yeah. for nationals, and they were playing the YMCA song to get the crowd pumped up, and my students are like dancing to it. And I turn around and I go, Y'all know this song's about LGBT homelessness, right? And they're like, Later, Thomas. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Time and place, man. I'm Time working and place. on my M. It's exactly. weird. Exactly. Look, look up the lyrics now with that understanding as to what That's the YMCA used to be. Um, yeah. And there's an episode of The Office where Michael sends Dwight to go buy something with his credit card, and Dwight is like, I need to know your pin. And Michael just goes, it's fun to stay at the... And, <laughs> and Dwight just goes, huh? And she he goes, it's fun to stay at the... And Dwight goes, Holiday Inn. Um, I don't know. Yeah, sorry. That was great. I had to pull up the lyrics, too. Um, 
So first, I think people forget the song YMCA is by the Village People, <laughs> which is a famous gay band. That's hysterical. You know I what did not they know dressed that. up as, right? No, it's like the Village People. <laughs> yes, the Village People. They dress up. I'm as not the talking village people. about the movie The Village from M Night Shyamalan, <laughs> which is also loved by the gay community. I don't know why, but whatever. Get into that later. Um, the Village People, the band. It's like one is a sexy construction worker, one's a sexy cop. I think one's a sexy sailor, and then one is now obviously super inappropriate. But at the time, it was like the seven. Yeah. a sexy Native American ah, and then they had what? a bunch of songs yeah but it was, they were like super gay and they oh, wrote yes. the YMCA the profession the opening line is young man there's no need to feel down I said young man pick yourself up off the ground and then let's fast forward a little bit young man <laughs> this is part of the chorus they have everything for young men to enjoy you can hang out with all the boys that's hysterical. Yeah, no, that that's really obvious. But please play it before your Christian youth basketball tournament. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me so happy. I think I've lost the thread a little bit I as did to too. where we were. Oh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, they, YMCA was yes, mentioned, they're... and I was like, well, I can't let that pass. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I'm a menace and I'm sorry. I hope I'm not ruining it. And if I am, it's, he's it's a white bald man, so no one will say anything. Someone did message us, ask how I got my head shaved so nicely. Oh, thank you <laughs> for all for, for 100 bald mean jokes. It's nice to get one person be like, you legitimately do a delicious job. This is legitimately a delicious wing. <laughs> Tell your story, Maya. <laughs> anyway, we have drag balls, <laughs> and they're being the word is spread okay. at the YMCA. Obviously, obviously, yes. yes. Okay. So many guests of these drag balls were formerly enslaved people, including Swan's lover, uh, Pierce Lafayette. Uh, Pierce Lafayette had been a born enslaved person in Georgia, and had been owned by Alexander H. Steffens, the VP of the Confederacy. Oh. Yeah. Lafayette had previously had a relationship with Felix Hall, who was called, for whatever reason, Lafayette's, quote, Negro mistress. Oof. And I don't know where he was called this. Wait, are both these men black or African-American? Yes. And only one of them is called? The Negro mistress. Yeah. I'm not sure if maybe Lafayette had, like, a... A higher like position like in the oh, house that like he worked at or something like that social class economic status, yeah or something, something and like so that. they called oh, okay. this okay. yeah okay. um but it was documented somewhere and so their relationship is the first documented same-sex relationship between two enslaved men in the oh, united states awesome. i mean sorry not awesome that they're enslaved no but it's like an I interesting awesome tidbit as you said enslaved I, I get it but like awesome that we have a documentation of, of it because yeah. it's so hard to find documented it's gay history crazy yeah so anyway pierce lafayette would go on and is would become a uh, William Dorsey Swan's lover around this time. Guests to these drag balls would wear women's clothing or men's suits and would dance to folk music. The balls would often include a competition, a quote, resistance dance, the cakewalk. Do you know what a cakewalk is? No. Really? What's a cakewalk? Y'all. There was, when <laughs> I, I feel I, so good about When this. I was a kid, sorry, Norman Rockwell moment. Yeah. When I was a kid and the elementary school would have uh -huh. its parent family carnival at yeah. the end of the year, one of the games you could play was called the cakewalk, where you would yeah. walk around in a circle on numbered pads mm -hmm. and then the music would stop and they'd pull a number. And if you were standing on that number, you won a small cake. That is the only cakewalk I have participated so in. So similar, actually. Uh, oh, fun. It was for real. Well, <laughs> this is the YMCA song the all end. over again. Only the oh. end. <laughs> so the cake the cakewalk was dubbed the cakewalk because um, if you won if you won this you would get cake nice. as a gift. Okay, However, Marie it Antoinette, pop was off. started on enslaved <laughs> on plantations in the South okay. uh, in the antebellum era. It was held by enslaved people on these southern plantations. Um, historian Richard Kislan, anyway, author of musical the musical, a look at the at the American musical theater said uh it is coupled dancers quote executed walking steps and figures in precise formations as if in mimicry of the white man's attitudes and manners oh, so they just like parodied the awful white men that yes. had enslaved them yeah and if you did the best impersonation you won cake the that's uh, so cool i know the plantation owners often didn't know that this was what it was 
that that's what's happening. Uh, enslavers, unaware that they were being mocked, would be jud- would judge these competitions and would award cake to the because winning couple. Because the, the enslaver, the white enslaver, mm-hmm. is like, oh, it's a competition? Who can be the best me? This feeds my ego. It's Fantastic. N- it's not even about, I don't think they realize it's about them. They're just like, who did the best performance? Oh. So this is where voguing comes from, actually. It's like actively spitting in the face mm-hmm. of your enslaver without yeah. them knowing it. And this is kind of where we get kind of the the over dramatic exaggeration of drag performances. I'm fascinated. Right? Please continue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's way more about this if you like want to get into it. Um so okay. This is a I have a video of a cakewalk from a historian Channing Joseph. And Channing Joseph kind of like has pioneered this research into William Dorsey Swan. We didn't really know that much about William Dorsey Swan until like 2005 oh, whoa. when Channing Joseph came upon some records that mentioned him. And so this is the clip that I'm going to show you is a one minute silent clip from 1903. Wow. And it's currently the oldest known film of a drag performer. So That's another thing, one of the oldest known films. Like, yes. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, so the dancers, one in striped pants, the other in a dress, were recorded in France by Louis Lumiere. <laughs> the dance, the dancer in a dress is Jack Brown, an American from Virginia. In the show, they performed a version of the cakewalk, a dance invented by enslaved people and the precursor to voguing. Okay, sorry, give me a second. Okay, so you're about to show us a clip from uh, 1903? 1903, okay. yes. It's a one minute, it's called Le, Le cakewalk. cakewalk. A nouveau cirque. A new circus or performance or something. So this person in the dress is in drag. This is like the first, the the earliest video we have of someone performing in drag. And this is a version of the cakewalk. There's like a lot of jumping. They're playing with the dress. They're both smiling. There's a lot of eye contact. You can really tell that they're like really over exaggerating a lot of their movements. Yes. Too. There's a lot of like footwork. Yes. There's a lot of like bowing. Well, you can tell it's like a parody. Yes. It's just really joyous. Yes. You're left. I mean, you're kind of guessing as to what kind of music will be playing during this. Yeah. But I would assume folk music. Yeah. You could almost imagine clapping in the background yes. as yes. they do something like 100%. this. And they're both dressed so well. Wow. Yeah. They're both just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. And that's that. That's... Just fascinating. It's fascinating. It's... It's honestly really moving. Like, right? they don't... So much of that stuff gets destroyed. It gets, like, lost, too. And yeah. I... Th- part of me wonders if the reason why that clip was able to live for mm-hmm. 121 years Was because later, people didn't realize that right, it was Or a didn't mockery. think it was important enough to even investigate yeah. the lives of some of these people. That, like, they were so outcast Mm -hmm. from society Mm -hmm. that if someone did want to save it, like they were kind of, it was spared from further review, Mm -hmm. you know? I think, I think you've done just a really cool job. I'm sorry. (laughs) Last week we're talking about like, here are like famous people that like were maybe gay and like let's talk about what that means. And then for the pendulum to swing from like, here were people who in their own lifetimes were probably Mm -hmm. completely anonymous. And to have more crystal clear evidence of their queer lifestyle. Yeah, it's nuts. It's telling, it's super cool, it's moving. You've done a wonderful job so far. I'm absolutely delighted. So that video is called, Now That Takes the Cake. (laughs) Volume two. (laughs) And now that I'm thinking about it. I wasn't prepared for a kids bop reference, I'm sorry. Well, here's what I'm thinking is that, I'm not sure I didn't actually process this until right now, is that this might be the origin of that phrase, that takes the cake, because they would win cake. Oh my God. If it is. Because, like, that takes the cake is, like, that's the winner, right? Also, I was prepared for you to say that might have been the origin of the phrase, now that's what I call music. <laughs> <laughs> the kids' bop CDs. Yes. <laughs> that, too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Swan hosts these cakewalks as part of his his uh, drag balls. He's also enthralled by the Queens of Freedom, which, mm. if you remember, are the queens are the people representing the different neighborhoods in D.C. as part of their emancipation parades. And so they would be crowned at D.C.'s Emancipation Day parades. Swan would then crown winners of his dance competitions, the, quote, queen of the ball, and award them a hoe cake, which is a cornmeal pancake. Oh. It was like they're winning the cakewalk. And so he would be the first to describe himself as the queen of drag. 
Uh, drag referred to the cross-dressing aspect of it. Queen at the time referred to, the, like, was used to... It was to say that you were the best. The leader of the drag ball. You were the best and feminine presenting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not in the way that many of us use the queen mm -hmm. now. Yes. And so around this time, I'm not sure if this was around William Dorsey's time or a little bit after, is when they started using the term mother, which is also mm. pretty common in drag culture, is that they had these familial relationships. Yeah. And so, it's still super common. Yeah, and so mother and queen were two of these terms that they would use it's to... It's very matriarchal. Yes, exactly. Um, so... This is a quote, I think, from Channing Joseph. Uh, there's a concept of drag, which is separate, and then there's the concept of queens of freedom. And in D.C. in this particular time, post-slavery, post-reconstruction, these two concepts collide. To identify as a drag queen, which is what William Dorsey Swan did, is combining these two strains, these two cultural traditions. Um, in 2005, historian Channing Joseph uh, found a Washington Post report from 1888 when police raided Swan's home at the time of one of these dances. So he's been hosting these since 1882. That's when he was caught stealing party supplies. Right. So 1888, a police raided. I actually seem to remember I came across something that said it was actually Pierce Lafayette's home that the this particular drag ball was hosted at. Um, but anyway, they get raided. The report suggests or says that guests wore satin dresses and fascinators, which I didn't know what that is. It's a hmm. woman's light decorative headpiece consisting of flowers, feathers, and beads. Huh. Yeah, so um, clearly cross-dressing. Swan attempted to prevent the police from entering the home, which gave several party-goers the time to escape before Swan himself got arrested. Reports of raids on Swan's parties were heavily sensationalized, largely because a majority of the participants were black. Right. Um, so the reason that Swan really tried to play interference, I guess, with these cops was not just because, like, he morally believed what he was doing was right. 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 Like, there's nothing wrong with hosting parties right. for these people. He was also doing it because he knew that if people in that party get arrested, their name is published in mm, the newspaper, mm -hmm. and then they'll be the face or the the victim of public scorn. And so... I mean, that'll continue for oh, yeah. decades Forever. after this kind of yeah. raid. And so I think, I think there's probably... A, a good part of Swan's like mental calculation here that knows he's going to get arrested, but right. knows that he has to do whatever he can to give the people in that house enough time to escape or take off whatever Change. they're wearing right. or whatever. So this would not be the first or last raid on Swan's uh, parties. He was often arrested and jailed for hosting these balls without ever being charged with a specific crime. He would hmm. be arrested as being a, quote, suspicious character, along with the participants. Uh, he would also be charged with, quote, keeping a disorderly house, which is basically being charged with operating a brothel, right. is what that is. So here we start to see, like, some of the incorporation of assuming anyone that's different from you in like a sexual way or presenting way is inherently sexual when mm. it's not like you're he's operate he's hosting a dance right he's hosting a competition and they're saying like you're hosting a brothel i'm gonna pause for one yeah, second for in case you end up drawing a line to this yeah, later go for it. but this feels like a clear line between mm -hmm. like assuming Drag mm -hmm. is inherently sexual in the 1880s, all the way to assuming no. drag is inherently sexual during like drag queen story time at your local mm -hmm. library yeah. or things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's not. It's not. I have a whole. Okay. I have a little. I have. I'll, I have. This I will let you tell that story. Beautifully then, written article that I didn't even try to like. <laughs> Been there, done that, yeah. or my best work yes. comes from somebody else. Exactly. I was reading this, and I was like, I can... No, I'm just, I'm I'm just, just going to read it. Okay, control A. Oh, I didn't and... even do... I just put the link oh, in here. Right. I was like, I can't. <laughs> so, this isn't worth it. So the charges he was often charged with were related to vagrancy. Uh, we don't... We would not have any records of these drag balls if it weren't for these raids. Okay. So that's why we're not... In, entirely sure that he's the first person that hosted them. We're only sure because there were raids and there's evidence, and that's what uh, Channing Joseph found in 2005 is the report of this raid. Um, unfortunately, if the balls were raided, those who were caught there would have their names reported by the police. If their names were printed, they would be the subjects of scorn. Uh, here's a quote. In post-Civil War America, there was very little patience for men who subverted gender norms. The 1800s attitude towards masculinity was obviously very strict, as right. it seemed. It's, I don't know. It's uh, 
I feel like it's well known at that point. Like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's going to be some toxic masculinity that's going to continue yes, to this day, including, but that is going to be violently enforced, mm-hmm. including from people like Lincoln and F- Frederick Douglass, who are both people who obviously were played big parts in right. r- like subverting racial prejudices. Were progressive in certain yes. areas for their mm-hmm. time. Uh, Lincoln is quoted at the start of the Civil War saying, go forward without fear and with manly hearts. And mm. I think that it was intentionally... Uh, like a dig. Yeah, a dig. Yeah. Um, and then Frederick Douglass in 1879 said, quote, with a, a full complement of manly qualities, the Negro could and would make himself respected in every part of the Republic. So it goes to show that being an outcast is already uh, difficult, and even more so if you're in a, a member of a marginalized community. So, like, you just have to go that much further to, like, prove yourself because you're already you're already black in an area that's not going to necessarily accept you as being black. But you're black you're, in a country that would have enslaved you 20 years ago. Yes, and then you're also a member of a drag community right. that people are like, okay, well, I already don't relate to you on this level, and even further, I can't relate to you in your expression of your gender. Correct. Yeah. You're defying too many social norms. You mm-hmm. are maybe at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of power mm-hmm. in this culture at the time, and we're going to punish you for it. Yeah. Here are some snippets of some news articles covering that raid. The title, it's what we talk about all the time where the newspaper headings are just like... Huge and then huge, less huge. And then a little less huge, <laughs> a little less huge, and they're all titles, and you slowly get the entire story and before reading the like story. And then there's like three regular sentences yes. at the bottom. Good, mm-hmm. okay. So it's... Hit me with these. <laughs> quote, the queen raided. Stop. Unexpected interruption to her banquet and ball. Stop. Her majesty shows fight with a policeman. In the contest, her handsome dress was torn off. All landed in the station house. Stop. I love that your voice itself got a little smaller with every (laughs) other headline. It's harder to read. (laughs) Um, I'm not going to read all of this because it, it... it's just like telling you what happened, but the top two headlines are colored men in female attire stop police raid on a dancing party. And then within the uh, l- the block of the article, uh, they list all the names mm. of the people that were there or the people that were taken. Yeah, anyway, it just says they were charged with vagrancy. So following his arrest in 1888 for quote, keeping a disorderly house, AKA operating a brothel, <laughs> Uh, Swan wrote a letter to... Pres- Sorry, but it wasn't actually a brothel. No, it wasn't. Right. That's just what they charged him with. Okay. Um, yeah. So Swan wrote a letter to President Cleveland in 1896 demanding a pardon. He had been sentenced for 300 days, which is about 10 months. Wow. Uh, I think he was admitted in sometime in January of 1896. Uh, the National Archives actually has a copy of all of the documents included in this petition, which was crazy. So I went through that. And um, Swan gave the following reasons to support his plea for a pardon. One, he's always been a hardworking and industrious man, evidenced by his continuous employment by General Dudley, a well-known mm. citizen of D.C. Um, he had been a house servant for him for 11 years. I'm not sure if that's where his janitorial job was or or not. But um, Two, the unusual severity of the sentence. He got what would be considered the max sentence for, for, his. for this. Yeah. And then three, if pardoned, he will hereafter live a proper and law-abiding life. Mm. I work hard. I was punished to the extreme, and I'll stop doing drag if you pardon Right me. now. Yeah. Um, this letter was put together with the help of lawyers and also included signatures from, I think, 30 or more um, members of the community to support his innocence. Okay. And, like, kind of act as character witnesses. In support of Swan, friends said that Swan's health was in a precarious position and further confinement would endanger his health and life. Well, and to be a black man who's mm-hmm. arrested and charged for this specific crime mm-hmm. during this time, yeah. like, your your every day has to be a battle to survive. Yes, especially after you're being prisons. publicized. Yes. So people know who you are. Um, several of his friends believed that he was dying. And so yeah. they had given calls to whatever office was in charge of kind of getting this uh, thing to President Cleveland. This was corroborated by reports from the jail physician. Uh, these reports were sent at, to this office or whatever as part of this pardon were added to this pardon um by the warden of the jail on, okay. i think by the request of president cleveland's office they're not cleveland no yeah, cleveland um, yeah, over cleveland i thought i said the wrong name Maybe. okay so it was corroborated by the jail physician who examined swan on march 16th of 1896 saying he was in good health 
But then on July 20th uh, of that same year, said Swan had a disease of the heart and confinement was impairing his health. Oof. July 25th, he said that confinement was then also endangering his life. So they're all corroborating this. They're saying like... And it's not like the jail physician is like a friend of no, Swan's beforehand or anything. If you read the letters, they're all like... Basically what I read is what's in that note. It's very impersonal. It's right. just like... Yeah, he's dying. He's dying. That's it. Signed, jail physician, basically. Okay. Um, on March 14th, 1896, A.A. A. Bernie, who is an attorney, disputed or kind of argued against the the plea for a pardon. Okay. And he says this, quote, This petition is wholly without merit. While the charge of keeping a disorderly house does not on its face differ from other cases in which milder sentences have been imposed, the prisoner was in fact convicted of one of the most horrible and disgusting offenses known to the law, an offense so disgusting that it is unnamed. This is not the first time that the prisoner has been convicted of this crime, and his evil example in the community must have been most corrupting. In my opinion, he should have been sentenced. He should be sentenced had it been possible to so long a period in the penitentiary that his presence in the community could never again pollute it. I therefore recommend that the petition be denied. And this was endorsed by one of the judges. Can I share? Yeah, go for it. There is this like criticism mm -hmm. that in major cities at least, like that Pride Week and the Pride Parade mm -hmm. is like super visible, that it's hyper visible, that it's too out there. Yeah. And I think a part of the gay history that we've discussed already during this theme, but it's like, this man was holding parties at his home. It's not like he was marching down the street in yeah. the 1800s. He was holding a private event in his home, and that was viewed as so criminal mm -hmm. that a lawyer was like, we should have locked him up for the rest of his life. Yeah. So the fact that we have fought as a community against those legal constraints, mm -hmm. um, I don't think our community would insist on being so public now if even in private, our lives in our community hadn't been so criminal for so long. Yeah. That like essentially we are having the exact opposite reaction to what people only two, three, four generations removed mm -hmm. from this experience um, would have lived through, yeah. right? Like my last living grandparent right now uh, was born in the 1920s, for mm -hmm. example. So we are two generations, three generations crazy, removed yeah. from living memory for these kind of things. Um, I just, to hear that lawyer write that letter that's like, not only is this without merit, but we should have locked him up more, yeah. and the punishment he's experiencing isn't enough. It's like- It's insane. It's insane. Who was he hurting? Who was Literally he damaging? No what one. part of culture or, it was so secret and so private. What about a culture, society, or community? Oftentimes, here's the thing, I'm sorry. I'm, no, gonna, go I'm gonna wind no, it down right after this. The stereotype that gay people make good neighbors is because we oftentimes are not trying to draw excess attention mm -hmm. to ourselves. So like the yard's gonna be clean, the landscaping's going to be nice, you're not gonna have a noise complaint or anything mm -hmm. like that, because there is like a long-standing tradition in our community to basically try to be as as anonymous as possible in the places that we occupy. And mm -hmm. so even like these positive stereotypes now of like, oh, the gay couple moved in, like guess like the landscaping's gonna get nice and stuff is 100% tied back to this history of like, we just wanna be left alone in the privacy of our community, mm -hmm. of our friends and our homes. Yeah. It's insane that this person not only was like, this is so disgusting, it's worse than actually operating a brothel. Right. He was literally hosting a dance competition right. wearing a fun costume. Correct. Like no one was going to leave pregnant, no money was exchanging yeah, hands. No one was being hurt. And you know it's also what I'm going to just go ahead and guess. Yeah. No one's loitering out front. Nope. No one's hanging around street corners. Because You're they not can't. bringing increased yeah. crime to the neighborhood or anything. Yeah. Exactly. So, um the not the bright side i guess one of the interesting facts about this whole scenario this plea for a pardon is that it's recognized as the first time a person has taken legal steps to defend the right mm. of assembly for a queer party it represents the earliest documented example of an american activist taking quote specific legal and political steps to defend the queer community to gather without the threat of criminalization suppression or police violence 
the right of assembly guaranteed in the First Amendment. History <laughs> teacher. <laughs> it's yeah. right there alongside freedom of religion and freedom of press mm-hmm. and freedom of speech. Yeah. If you can say what you want and worship who you want and publish what you want, you can also assemble to do as you, you want, please. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, I think this would kind of start kind of a long standing tradition of members of the queer community being activists for other marginalized communities like we i briefly wanted to talk about marsha p johnson and all of this as well but then william dorsey just got so interesting that i I wasn't able to like go into the depth that i wanted to with them um well that's why i mean to be frank now mm -hmm. in this conversation that's why oftentimes the most disappointing gay people you will meet are and i'm sorry but it's it's like white gay people, yeah. right? Like members of the LGBT community that then also hold like a second status, right? As like a, a racial minority or whatever else might have like yeah. uh, colored your experience in life up mm-hmm. to this point. Um, oftentimes make these people like hyper vigilant, super active, deeply empathetic people. Yes. And the most disappointed people in our community <laughs> are people like me yeah. who are like middle class white gay dudes who are like their LGBT identity is the only kind of way that they step mm. out of like social order. And it means they're just not with the program in the way mm-hmm. that a lot of other people are. And it can be super frustrating. It can be super frustrating when I see like some of my m- gay friends that are still like adamantly in support of other measures that are marginalizing other groups. Correct. And more often than not, they seem to be members that are or like people that are already privileged in yes. some way. And they're just, I don't know. They kind of use the gay card as it were to like say like, well, I'm marginalized in this way. And I don't think this is fair to not put these restrictions on other groups. No, that is weird. That, that yeah. Didn't it make them radically empathetic yes. in the way that I feel like my identity has done that to me. Mm-hmm. Like I just, yeah. I am oftentimes left like disappointed, like mm-hmm. you said, but also like scratching my head. Like yeah, how did how? how did you and I yeah. kind of run the same course and then end up at opposite at, conclusions? Like completely opposite. Yeah, it's and always like been where crazy. what colored your heart in yeah. that conversation that mm-hmm. led you to this? Yeah. Yes. So unfortunately, uh, he was denied that pardon okay. by President Cleveland, which is unfortunately not surprising. Um, he did not die in jail though. He was let out. I think it was September of that year okay. when the the natural course of the 300 days was up. Um, Following this, Swan was likely unable to find work due to his growing infamy. And by 1900, he returned home to Hancock, Maryland. He then died there in 1925. How many years after his release? Uh, That would have been two years. Okay. Uh, Or no, 1996. So what? four years. 1896. 1896 was while he was in jail. So he went home four years after that and then died 25 years, so like 30 years. Okay, so he left D.C. four years after his release in Mm -hmm. 1900 Mm -hmm. and then died in 1925. Yep. Which Um, is now only a year or two removed from my grandmother's birth. That's crazy. That is wild. Uh, Yeah, history is crazy. This this part also got me. Um, So drag balls continued in D.C. and then were also being hosted in other cities starting in the early 1900s. One of Swan's younger brothers, Daniel J. Swan, who I believe was in D.C. at the time, continued his brother's legacy by by costuming the D.C. drag community until his own death in 54. Oh, whoa. Yeah. The Eisenhower administration? Okay, so his brother isn't competing, but is helping provide yeah. costumes and I stuff. didn't get any confirmation if he was ally. gay or not, but sure. he was like, here. Yeah, I know what you're looking for. You <laughs> Check need out a, the silk dress I you, got. You need a satin dress that can yeah. fit a six foot three frame. I yes. got you. Yes. yes. Oh my God. <laughs> There's an episode of Bob's Burgers where... There's always an episode the, of Bob's oh, Burgers. Like, <laughs> every one of our episodes. <laughs> What's the name of the drag queen in Boston? I think it's like Marshmallow. Marshmallow. Yeah. Hey, she baby. has a heel. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love Marshmallow and Bob's relationship. Yes. But she, she leaves a heel, I think, at one point. And she like doesn't want it back. And so Linda uses it as like a wine holder. Yes. And then they want to make a big? business yes. yeah, out of it. So they go to the place that Marshall bought the thing and it was like, how cheap can we get these heels? And the person that's running the store goes like on this rant about how hard Expensive. it is to make heels yes. that can support like a male body. It is the first 30 minutes of the musical Kinky Boots yes. too, just so you know. That is it. the origin of that story. So funny. Yes. No, okay. Kinky Boots is all about, I think, oh, don't quote me on yeah. this, musical theater 
to friends, help me out here. But it's like a vaguely true story of mm-hmm. a British bootmaker who was having a really hard time. It was like a 100 year old yeah. business having a hard time staying in business. Ugh. And then a drag queen was like, do you know how hard it is to find boots that can support me to like do the dance that I want? True. And so they help make these new boots. That's so cool. And they specialize in it. Oh, and it's a movie too. Can you guys, yeah. I think it was a movie before it was a musical. I'm not sure. Sh- I, I know that my, my choir teacher was in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I like the original Broadway production of it? One or? of the Broadway productions. Yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. sure. Also, uh, sorry, Bob's Burgers is so great. I saw this clip last night of... Uh, this, I, it's a it's a very short clip, so I don't know exactly what shenanigans the, context is, right, yeah. the Belchers have gotten yeah. into. But Gene looks at Bob and he goes, Hey, Dad, I want you to know I'm having a really good childhood. <laughs> Like obviously, like not right now, but like in general, I think you're doing a really good job. It's so funny. I think they're like hiding from yeah. someone, and Bob just wants everyone to be quiet. And Gene's like, I think you're doing a good job. And Bob's like, Great, that's great, Gene. Shut the fuck up. Exactly. There's always a Bob's Burgers yes. episode. So I keep seeing the horse meat episode where she has to have a straight face. I love that episode. Give me your everything's all right. Smile. <laughs> this is an absolute no, grimace. no, 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyways, continue. okay. So we're gonna get into my final thoughts before the final thoughts. Ooh, okay. Um, because I want to end on a happy note, and this is—I mean, we're not gonna be happy. In this. I'm excited for two reasons. One, excited for a happy note. Yeah. Okay, two, uh, three notes. Two, uh, <laughs> excited to hear your final Shocking. thoughts. Three, a little snackish. <laughs> yeah, okay, so here are a few quotes from. One of my main uh, sources was an article by Smithsonian. And so these are some quotes from some of the historians that were featured in that article. Um, The first one, the identification of Swan as the first reported drag queen in the U.S. is a major event. Uh, This is a quote from Jen Mannion, a historian at Amherst College. She goes on to say, the LGBTQ history is hampered by the lack of diaries and personal letters on fa- and family papers because you just don't put those feelings in writing. For much of recorded history, being gay or bisexual was considered a sin. It's illegal. And so that just goes on to show like why there's not so much of a recorded history about this. Um, another quote. What's unique about Joseph, Joseph Channing, the guy who did spearheaded a lot of this work on William Dorsey Swan. What's unique about Joseph's work is that it captures a collective community. When we have been able to identify queer and trans figures in this area, in this era and earlier, we find them in isolation <laughs> and we can seldom connect the dots to say, oh, these two couples were friends. They always hung out. Mm-hmm. We have very little evidence of collective socializing. And they were roommates. And they were roommates. Famous for their doily collection and elegant dinner parties. And never married. Never married. <laughs> <laughs> Um, This is another thought. The Stonewall riots are thought of as the beginning of the fight for gay liberation, but Mm. Swan's actions in the late 1800s laid the foundation for this kind of fight. Um, And his story is not as frequently told. I mean, we didn't even really know about his contribution until 2005, which is so recent. But that you need the community space to exist before that community mm-hmm. can organize. Yes, in exactly. A space. Yeah. Um, so modern arguments against drag performances and drag performers is that even the existence of the LGBTQ community is that their existence is inherently sexual and is therefore a threat to children, especially. Um, they People will often argue that they're a degenerate social phenomenon, um, and that is categorically incorrect. And now I'm going to go to this article that I like could not summarize because it was just so beautifully written. Okay. This is actually a source that Casey sent me while I was getting my makeup I done yesterday. <laughs> uh, and because I asked him to like research kind of the history of drag, and he sent me this article, which is by uh, Spencer McDaniel. And this is his blog. He is, or sorry, she is a master student in ancient Greek and Roman studies at Bandeus University. I think according to her blog, she's officially set to graduate this year in oh, May. Congratulations. Yes. Um, her name's what again? Spencer McDaniel. Spencer McDaniel. Yeah. Congratulations, and so, professor, doctor, master's. Master. I think it said, one of her blog posts, she said she's trying to get into a PhD program. M.A. Right McDaniel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this article was actually about, um, is specifically about how cross-dressing was very common in ancient Greek Greek culture. And there's a lot that goes on in ancient Greek culture, like pedophilia. That's not so cool as it were today, right? Um, But this is what Spencer said. Um, Okay. 
Her whole argument is basically that if you're going to argue that drag culture or gay culture is categorically morally incorrect by like the laws of history, that this has never once been done before, you're doing a brand new thing right. that needs that's to evil be, and bad. that's evil and bad, is just categorically incorrect. And she uses her history degree to kind of be like, I'm not saying that the Greeks were right in everything that they did, because right. obviously a lot of it is wrong. But, we have some notes. Right. But you're incorrect. Um, she says, I would be the very last person to argue that anyone today should decide what is appropriate for minors on the basis of what the ancient Greeks thought was appropriate. Mm. Times have changed. The ancient Greeks were certainly wrong about many things, including, in some cases, what they thought was appropriate for minors. After all, it was common for ancient Greek parents to force their daughters when they were in their mid to late teenage years to marry adult men who were often more than twice their age. Meanwhile, many, if not most, ancient Greek people regarded the practice of pedas, pedera, ped, ooh, God, pederasty, aka erotic relationships between adult men and adolescent boys, as completely normal and acceptable. Both of these practices are abominable. Ab, wow, abon, abominable, and should have no place in the modern world. Nevertheless, there are two reasons why I think it is important to point out that the ancient Greeks had absolutely no problem with children viewing drag performances or dressing in drag themselves, at least for certain religious occasions. The first is because people on the right are trying to promote the narrative that children viewing or participating in any form of drag in any way is always an inherently degenerate social phenomenon that decent people in all periods of human history have always held this opinion and that this is a long-standing moral principle. By promoting this narrative, they seek to portray their own ongoing moral panic about children and drag as the natural, inevitable reaction of decent people to a depraved situation. Mm. For instance, in response to a drag event billed as child-friendly that was held on June 4th of this year, I think this was 2022 that she okay. published this, um, in an LGBTQ plus bar and nightclub, Mr. Mr. in Dallas, Texas, an article by the writer Micah B. Veillon, V-E-I-L-L-O-N, um, published in the paleoconservative online magazine, The American Conservative, explicitly invokes this talking point, asking... This is now a quote from that article or from that. From the conservative yeah. article. Yeah. Why is this, i.e. performing drag in front of children, something this performer has never done before? Some may answer because we have had a prejudice against allowing children to be exposed to sexual content and environments. In fact, one drag queen wondered why parents would not let their children attend events like these, claiming it is hard for kids to grow up in such a religious and conservative household. In other words, households where such prejudices would be learned, perhaps though. We have that prejudice for a reason. Perhaps it is a beneficial prejudgment reformed over the millennia and percolated through a tradition. Veon goes on later in the same article to specifically cite the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, who, it should be noted, never wrote anything about children and drag, for his idea that the human being is a, quote, political animal, and for his theory of virtue ethics. Um, Sorry, was that a quote from Aristotle or his young boy lover? What yes, are we talking about exactly. specifically there? Correct. Another quote from this, this blog post. Uh, the second reason I feel it is necessary to write this post is because many of the very same people on the political right wing who want to condemn children viewing or participating in drag as inherently a degenerate abomination are also ardent admirers of the ancient Greeks. These two opinions, however, that are rather difficult to reconcile when one considers just how widespread and common it was in ancient Greece for children to be exposed to drag. And then she goes on to kind of talk about more of the propaganda published um, by right-wing conservatives and talk about uh, how ancient Greeks really kind of relied on drag yeah. in some of their religious... Uh, Anytime a conservative says stuff like that, the mm -hmm. like it's a danger for them to like see stuff like this. I'm reminded of two things. First, it sounds a lot like women shouldn't be wearing pants, you know? Like yes. I what do you even mean by like gendered clothing a lot of times other than like specifically a like cisgendered man in a dress, which you inherently view as like um yeah. feminine, unless we're of course talking about like kilts, but mm -hmm. like whatever. So first it just feels very much like women shouldn't wear pants. And then second, uh, as a kid growing up, I was surrounded by no shortage of reinforcing social narratives yeah. that heterosexuality was the way to go and that homosexuality not the way to go. 
my beloved home state of Nebraska, was one of the first to ban same-sex marriages. It banned them in 2000. Holy shit. And so, yeah, it was one of the first. And so um, me and all of my friends from Nebraska, super gay now. So uh, <laughs> probably not up to persuasion, probably not up to uh, social environments to help depict all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. And also, like... Tell me you don't understand performance art without telling me you Literally, don't understand performance it's art. It's a performance. <laughs> right. What? And also, <laughs> oh, they, they, there's record of cross-dressing so far back. It's insane to me that they're like... Well, it's even like, what is even cross-dressing? Like, I don't... Yeah. Heels were masculine for a really long time. You go to the British Museum or any museum of art, um, and yeah. every photo of a king until like the 1900s is they are lemon pepper stepping out with, with like one calf. heel. Yeah, it's like calf and heel. Like, what is even considered feminine? Um... There is. I will see if I'll find it. I won't try mm-hmm. to like keep it a secret. No guarantees, though. But there's this old photo I've seen dozens of times of me at like four, five, six years old. Golden blonde hair, if you can imagine. <laughs> no. And I am in a pink polka dot dress I with like it. a little pink bow on it. Because my sister and our babysitter dressed me up like not How dare only you. i know and that's why i'm a homosexual now so <laughs> if anything uh so but no like what is but like, yeah trying on mom's clothes trying on dad's clothes mm-hmm. like little girls wearing like cowboy hats uh, or like their dad's overalls right little boys love finding their mom's heels and yeah. then trying to walk in them for a second it's like your view of the human spirit is so limited if it doesn't allow for any of that spirit to explore. It's it's just crazy to me how strict some of these norms are when it's just like it's all it's all a lie. Yeah. What? Like it's all just fake. We're all just here. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's it's just insane to like I one of my earliest memories um So I grew up in Aurora in Colorado, like, or I was born kind of there. That's where I spent my early years. And then I ended up moving, but I don't remember a ton of living over there. Cause when I moved, I was like second grade. And that's when you're starting to like really form long-term memories. Right. I remember before that for a really long time, my favorite color was blue. Hmm. And I went to, I think it was pre-K or something like that. And there was, I was sitting at a table with like a group of boys basically and we were doing a craft or something and the teacher dumped a pile of scissors on the table to like work on this craft and I reached for the only blue pair right. and one of the boys was like why do you get the blue pair and I was right. like well blue's my favorite color and he looked me in the eye and said like your favorite color can't be blue your favorite color has to be pink because right. you're a girl and my favorite color was then pink for like the next eight years or right. something like that. Like little things like that when you're at that impressionable of an age can change you. Pink has never once been my favorite color. I have an appreciation for it now, but I still hate it because I right. feel like I was forced into sure. liking it. It's fucking nuts. And your life wouldn't have been terrible if your life, if your favorite color was blue. Like, no, nothing would have been different. <laughs> nothing. But it was still like someone had indoctrinated that kid into sure. believing that like if you're a certain gender, you have certain preferences. And I mean, and you're young, so this is what, like 2005? <laughs> yeah, when they first found out about William Dorsey. This is probably, I mean, probably not far off. I was probably... I hate you. That was a joke for me. Early 2000s. Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> I, am, I am middle of Clinton administration for my version of these stories, I want you to know. <laughs> okay, so let's get into the final, final thoughts. Oh, fine, okay. So... In 2022, Washington, D.C. rededicated Swan Street to be known, to be dedicated to William Dorsey Swan. Okay. This street is near, or is in DuPont neighborhood. Um, DuPont includes Strivers Historic District, which was a locus for black businesses, education, and religion, and also Grant's favorite cocktails. Uh, It's a really famous gay community there. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So prior to rededication, it was still known as Swan Street, um, but it was believed to be named after Thomas Swan, who was a former Maryland governor, Baltimore mayor, Mm. slave owner, and known defender of slavery. So it was officially renamed. So it's Swan Street named after Thomas Swan. And then they introduce a bill that wants to rededicate Swan Street to William Dorsey Swan. That is not renaming it, basically. Right. It's rededicating It's it. rededicating yeah. it. And so they were able in early 2023 to officially rename it from Swan Street 
to Swan Street, <laughs> but this time... <laughs> For the right reasons. Yeah, uh, named after the good swan, uh, William Dorsey Swan. And this is called the William Dorsey Swan Street Desi- Designation Act of 2023. There's also a plaque, I believe, that was put up at the corner of New Hampshire Ave um, at Swan Street Northwest and 17th Street Northwest. Um, this is a quote, again, I think from the Smithsonian article, quote, one of the things that's so exciting about this case is that it is an African-American man who is formerly enslaved. Such individuals just don't get recognition in our histories of LGBTQ people, in part because we usually can't find them in the archives, but Swan was hiding in plain sight. So... Again, it's like important to remember that we didn't really know about him until 2005. Right, where we're rediscovering which all is this history. fucking crazy, yeah. So in 2020, Swan Street, if you've heard Swan Street and you're like, that sounds really familiar, you're right. Uh, in 2020, Swan Street made headlines during the George Floyd protests oh. in D.C. Um, there was a series of row houses on this street, one of which is occupied by, occupied by Rahul Duby. Um, protesters were being herded by police onto Swan Street near DuPont Circle. Um, police were using helicopters, flashbang u- munitions, um, etc. Swan Street is a narrow one-way street, aka a perfect place for police to box mm. in a crowd. Um, I think the goal here was that they had just um, put in a curfew because of all the, the riots mm. and mm-hmm. protests. Um, and so they were trying to arrest as many people as possible because it was just after that They're trying curfew. to trap them. Yes, exactly. Um, Doobie, the owner of that row house, said, quote, they unleashed sheer hell on peaceful protesters right outside of my stoop. I don't know. I just flung the door open and I kept yelling, come in, get in the house, get in the house. And he got about 70 people in his home. Whoa. Uh, he said, quote, it was a full escalator is what it felt like just pouring into the house. I was screaming downstairs, outside, there's a backyard, upstairs, there's bedrooms. Um, there was this bottleneck and I didn't want anyone to get crushed, including myself. That night, D.C. police made 300 arrests, most of which were in violation of that 7 p.m. curfew. 194 people were arrested right in that area of Swan Street and DuPont Circle. Rahul was worried anyone who left the house after they got in would be arrested for breaking in. The curfew. Yeah. Well, also for breaking breaking into his house. Okay. And so he went around to each guest and gave them his business card. So if that situation arose, they could get in touch with Rahul. Um, Rahul said, quote, they waited for us, man, like predators so that they could arrest us. We were doing no wrong in my house. I Mm. even told the police they're my guests. Rahul's neighbors, which he had never even met, brought pizza over for the large group. The protesters ended up staying the night and Mm. left when the curfew was lifted at 6 a.m. By 2 a.m., Rahul had to institute two rules in his home because <laughs> there's 70 people right, in his strangers house. strangers in his he house. He ruled, he had to make two rules. One, no one is allowed to say thank you to me anymore <laughs> because it was like, you know, stop. Really uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. The other rule was that they were not allowed to ask me what my Venmo was. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that's so sweet. Um, and I just think... Will that's like very sweet. That's also like very millennial. Yeah. Like, I'm so sorry that I'm here at all. And, Can I please give you some money? And he's like, shut <laughs> the fuck up. That's I've gotten this question 65 times. That's so sweet. And I think William Dorsey Swan would be proud I think of be Rahul proud. that now lives on the street that is renamed named after him living, oh, yeah. um, being a representative for those doing their civic duty. And this is a picture of Rahul. Helping them again escape a police raid yes, for exactly. coming together. This is Rahul, I think, the morning after. This photo Aww. was tweeted by one of the protesters but after they left his I house. I that. I know. Um, so if you're learning... What a good final, final <laughs> thoughts. Mine have come up short by comparison. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about William Dorsey Swan, um, Channing Joseph is seemingly the expert. He's the one that found the 2005 raid report. He has a book titled House of Swan. Mm, nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where he uses archival research to paint a picture of Swan, who was the, quote, first queen American hero. I love that. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. It came together. Uh, yeah, really well. You're such a tease. I, I don't know how this is gonna. I just, I just kind of, I kind of do it all together. Da, 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 da. Like, no, really well done. <laughs> Honestly, out and about, I think really did kind of come together. It did. I think mine was out, and yours was, was about. about. <laughs> Wait, that's perfect. No, that's so cringy. That's hilarious. Yeah. No, really well done. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. proud of you. I'm I'm glad I narrowed it down instead of like trying to 
t- trying to include Marsha P. Johnson because she she deserves much more. She deserves more than just to be a footnote in yeah, a exactly. different person's story. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, I have truly no final reactions. I was there the entire time. I think I kind of lost the thread there for the I second somewhere in the middle. I think we had fun. I think we had fun. We <laughs> laughed. I'm gonna say that. Yeah. Well, I laughed. I, I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> you were I, sad for a second. This is me forgetting that you also came for me at the start of this episode. <laughs> but it's fine. Where it's a friendship podcast. Mostly. I didn't take the comment as a threat. I took it as a God. My gay friends are mean to me too. <laughs> I took it as like you don't even know how many that could be. <laughs> and I'm nice. <laughs> Nice. I love my friends. <laughs> yeah. That was good. This is also nice, but after today's run, I do need to stretch. So. That's fair. Yeah. Amazing. Thank okay. you. Well. Do you want to mute? You want to do it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you want to find us, we're on all social media as well. I laughed. Um, basically, if, if you have a social media profile um we're probably there i don't know uh and then if you want to email us for corrections or comments or concerns or just want to talk we're well off pod at gmail.com please allow us one to two business months to return <laughs> we're really bad at responding it's just, there's a lot going on we're just also i feel like grant and i are like we have to come up with the perfect response oh, right every now. time yeah. i'm like i'm not even in the right headspace to be yeah. talking to and then two months later <laughs> so sorry it took so long so sorry. uh if you want more content we're on patreon at well off podcast and the support that you you gave us there is amazing especially because our other source of income our unreliable one tiktok may be gone <laughs> oh that's so t- sometime soon let's not mourn that quite yet but I'm, I'm sad here's the thing is that <laughs> our I, favorite thing is to talk after we've done the closing speech i was getting but my, go off queen what's up <laughs> got my hair and makeup done yesterday right and we're all talking and they're like talking about the tiktok the potential tiktok ban and the other two people that are there are obviously creators because they're hair and makeup artists right. and so part of their job is like publicizing and they're like Honestly, I don't care what they do. They just need to decide. I'm sick of posting on everything. (laughs) And I was like, go off, Also, they should take down Instagram and Facebook first before they take down TikTok. Thank you. You know, Meta, which has actually caused damage to our democracy. It's been an issue. It's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Did you know... (laughs) The Muffin Man? Sorry. The owner of TikTok is Singaporean because apparently members of Congress did not. So I didn't know, but I also don't view TikTok as a threat. I mostly get recipes oh, from it. have you seen that? There's a video of the CEO of TikTok getting interviewed in like the... Oh, like at the congressional yeah, hearing? Yeah, at the congressional I've hearing. seen parts of that and it just makes me really and there, sad. Well, one, there's another one where a guy was like, are you related at all to the Chinese Communist Party? And he's like... <laughs> No. And he's like, do you have a Chinese... Isn't he like, I'm Singaporean? And they're like, so? Over and over again. And he's like, so do you have a Chinese citizenship? And he's like, I'm Singaporean. Honestly, Singapore could give America lessons on what capitalism is supposed to look like. Like, they are not a communist party. Oh, I shouldn't be so declarative on that. I need to check my Southeast Asian geopolitics more. No one correct us. We don't know. We should have ended the speech sooner. (laughs) And the camera died. Oh, okay, bye. Bye. Do you have any cheese? Nice. Thank you.